It's Friday, and I'm back with the next in our Fanzine Friday series. Today we're taking a look at Olympus number five. Please stick around. I'm AZ Mountaineer. This is our channel, Old School Rules, where we celebrate the community of old school gamers and grognards who like classic RPGs, miniatures, magazines, and everything that goes with it. Each week on the Fanzine Friday series, I take a fanzine from my collection off the shelf for a closer look. And today, from 1983, this is Olympus number five. Hope you enjoy the video. Today we're rounding out our look at Olympus, a fanzine that was produced uh, in Illinois in 1982 to 1983. This one, it says, is from July-August of 1983, so there's been quite a delay. They mentioned that the last one, would need, while it said January-February, didn't actually come out till late March, early, early April. So here's what it looks like. It's sort of the module sized, right, 8.5 by 11, sort of a glossy two-color cover, and then uh, like 11.5 by 17 paper folded in half stapled. Really, really good fanzine. Uh, you'll notice the price now has gone down to $1.25. Uh, so there's been actually been a price reduction. Don't see that particularly often. Here's the art. This art, again, just like last time, is by Peter Laird, uh, who has done the art uh, for these last couple of issues after uh, I think Bruce Smith had done it in the first um, three. I really like this art. You'll see there's like a, I'm assuming he's a halfling because he has hairy uh, feet there. The little character does by the skull. So it's sort of like a giant dragon, but with a unicorn horn, right? And then looks like he, as he's coming by that skull, a baby, I'm guessing maybe of the same thing, uh, pops out of one of the eye holes. So anyway, really, really cool. And as it says on here, we've got a new race, some secondary skills, fantasy fiction, look at potions, and a bunch of other stuff. Okay, so let's take a look at our table of contents. Editorial, monster population, where to put your monsters in your campaign, rules for jumping in AD&D, review of a game, the Narconan, which are the insectoid race, those ever elusive potions, a little bit more information for the dungeon master. Sorry, No Guarantee is um, an article about weapon breakage. Dreams can be fatal as fantasy fiction. Tinker, Taylor, Sailor, Smith. Secondary skills in Dungeons and Dragons. Keeping RPGs a challenge, some ideas for the Dungeon Master. Mercury, which is industry news and spell reactions, which is an idea about when two or more spells are cast and um, interact with each other. You see the contributors list here. It's, uh, it's getting larger. Um, Royce Calarid and Stephen Brees are still involved, of course. Scott Roy, Andrew Olesiak, um, still there. Then new people, Jeff Gallican, Robert Wallach, James Baker, and then Peter Laird does the uh, cover art and other art in here is by Stephen Winder, Anthony Orzic, Michael Nye, or Nye, and Scott Sackett. So all kinds of good stuff. The first thing I want to talk about actually is the um, is the inside cover, which is an advertisement from Labyrinth Games. And you may remember Labyrinth Games is sort of um, this group spinoff uh, company that's going to produce products, right? And they had one in the last issue, which was about um, these knolls. This is so. This is the second product they're advertising. This one I know they made. Uh, it is super rare. If you can ever find uh, a copy of this, I mean, it's hundreds, if not thousands, of dollars. Um, well, not thousands, maybe over a thousand dollars. Really, really rare. The Imliv River Valley, uh, state-of-the-art role-playing aids, and it's. Um, the Himlo or Himlaw Goblin tribe has come to Grimblewood, and war has been joined with the existing Uglo tribe. Your trade routes have been cut off. Your small village is in danger of dying. As ambassadors to Grimblewood, you must find a way to stop the Goblin War. Really cool. I've, I've seen this for sale briefly, and then it was sold before I had a chance to even take a look at it. And... Um, I've never seen the inside contents of it. But anyway, really cool. So I thought I'd share that with you. And now that I've made the connection between the people that made that product and the people that made this fanzine, I thought that was interesting. Okay, fleeting thoughts. Here's our editorial. This one is now by uh, Andy, who's the assistant editor. And um, basically talks about some of the changes that have occurred. He says, we got the 50 cent reduction in price. Um, probably because they got some advertising, but maybe they figured out a way to save money. I'm not really sure. Hopefully these prices will stay this low, he said. Talks about the fact that Stephen Breeser has moved to Florida and so probably does not have much to do with the, 
um, day-to-day work of putting this together anymore, even though he still contributes an article. Like I said, there's no indication that they were going to stop. So if, if this really is the last one, and I've, I've never seen number six for sale, talk to a couple of folks, they have not seen number six either. So it may be the end. Uh, it was kind of sudden, but you know I think that happens from time to time with these things. There's really no indication that they're not going to keep going, but they just you know they just stop. Um, the, yeah, I guess the only thing we would say is that it's taking them longer and longer to put out the issues. Right, this idea of putting one out every two months is clearly was ambitious, and they don't have the focus among the group to get that that done. As you see by the multi-month delay here. Okay. Um, and they say for the first time they've had too many articles and they said they had to save some for next time. And they even talk about what's going to be in the next issue, which I really wish they'd done because it talks about focused on paladins, chivalry, paladinhood, feudalism. We're covering all that in the next issue, they say. So maybe there's another you know issue out there and we'll find it. Royce Callard's article on monster population basically is saying give some thought to where you put whether it's a you know goblin tribe or a dragon or whatever it is, that you don't just randomly put stuff all over each other. And so he says, when your campaign map, you should at least make some notes. Well, so here, you know, there are goblins, here there are orcs, whatever it is, uh, so that you can look at your map and say, yeah, that makes sense. Because, you know, if you put those two things close to each other, like orcs and goblins, well, maybe they'd end up fighting with each other, right, for, for territory or whatever. So give some thought to where you put them on your map. And remember, there should be lots of sort of open space in between. Here's the art uh, Tony did on this one, and um, I think that's uh, Anthony Orzets, I would guess. I thought it was pretty good. Okay. Do I make it? Jumping in AD&D by Andrew Oluksiak. And he's basically saying, how do you figure out if people jump over a long distance like a pit? Um, and he starts off, with, or he ends, I should say, with a really good point, which is you don't have to roll for everything. You don't have to roll to jump over a two-foot stream, right? To don't go crazy with this. But he basically takes your movement rate, um, and he's got, you know, whether it's 12, 9, 6, 3 um, feet or inches uh, per round, and that's the length that you, the maximum length you can jump, which goes from a D8 plus 5 all the way down to a D4. Um, and then if you have a dexterity over 15, you get to add a foot, so 16, 17, 18, up to 3 feet extra. And then that's to cover the span. And then he also makes you roll a, what he calls a dex save, right? It roll a d20 and be under your dexterity to see whether you land cleanly or you sort of end up in a heap, tripping, falling when you get to the other side. We have a review, Dragon Rage, a uh, mini game by Dwarf Star, and uh, basically a fight of um, monsters against defending a, a walled city. It sounds pretty fun to me. You know, it's like a little board game as I understand it. We have a couple of cartoons. The first one is um, Michael Nye or Nye and he does the boule up here at the top which is knocking on a door and he says candy gram. So I guess that's just supposed to be silly because it's a monster. And then we have a second comic for Putso the wizard. And he talks about you know you think magic users are vulnerable because we don't have many hit dice but you don't understand all the great things we can do with our spells. We have a shield we can reflect normal missiles. We can cast protection from evil to keep baddies at bay and then we can use wall of fire wall of stone and protect ourselves from just about anything he says and then the comic is showing you under his feet a purple worm is coming up and so he's about to get eaten next we have the narconin an insectoid race he's got a little bit of background that these insectoid creatures uh sentient lived along this um you know along the seashore and had this really nice existence. And then humans came across in ships and caused them to flee eons ago. Now they live in this swamp, you know, where the humans don't go. Um, they don't like humans or demi-humans. And so they sort of have a mm, hatred, extreme dislike for them. Um, he explains sort of like an insectoid society. You've got the, um, you know, the worker, the workers, you've got some warriors, you've got, um, nobles and then you've got the priest group at the top in sort of their caste based society and the priests will harden the shells of their warriors as they go up in levels and that basically lowers their armor class and so for every uh, couple you get you get somebody a level higher 
and the bigger the group that's traveling together, the higher level veterans that might be with them. And if there are, I think it's uh, 12 or more, then there'll also be a priest traveling with the, uh, with the warriors. And so here's excellent art by Scott Sackett drawing these, uh, drawing these creatures. They also have the ability to exude a, um, or secrete a little misty substance that has the effect of a wall of fog um, for a couple of rounds, three rounds. Um, and then they have some spells affect them differently. They're not affected by sleep. Improved save against stinking cloud. Double the effect of a slow spell. No effect from a haste spell. And cold will cause them normal damage, but also cause them to fall asleep. We have an article here by Andrew um, Alexiak, which is for potions. And what he's got is basically gone through the potions that were in the um, DMG. And he puts them into classes, which is a smart way to do it. He's got things that affect a physical change in the character, a mental change. The physical change are things like climbing, you know, diminution, fire resistance, flying, gaseous form, stone giant strength, etc. Mental change like ESP, clairvoyance, etc control potions and then he's got all the different types of control and um and finally miscellaneous which is where he puts his healing potions and so he has for each of those a taste um, a color whether they're opaque or translucent or uh, transparent and i've done this in my own campaign frankly where i go through different types of potions and that's what i like to do is make this the type of potion is the same color um, which makes sense, right? If you're making a recipe, I mean, spaghetti sauce looks different than Alfredo sauce. And if you follow the recipe, you're gonna get the same look to it every time, even though the taste maybe is a little bit different. So that's my logic. I like his idea of he puts a taste to it as well. Um, okay, then Steve Breeser's got this little article about the fact that, you know, not every weapon you're gonna get sold is gonna be a good one. And so there's gonna be bad merchants and people out there who will sell rusted things that have been maybe you know disguised so you can't see how rusty they are or just basically poorly made weapons and so he says every once in a while you should throw that in there people buy stuff in town don't let them get a high quality and which of course will break under stress i.e in combat james baker has a one-page uh, piece of fiction it's okay robert wallet has tinker taylor soldier smith and this is a nice um explanation or flushing out of the secondary skills that are in the dungeon master's guide um, with his thoughts on how you use those in a game which is i think helpful so the armor he says you will be able to repair things but cannot in his case and he puts good limits on the stuff i think cannot make new armor for the party they can only fix or patch things the boyer uh, bowyer fletcher uh practical because in his mind, you never became a master craftsman, right? You were only an apprentice for a few years, and then you decided to adventure. So that's why he's got these limits on here. Um, you can certainly uh, um, repair bows and make arrows when you're back in town, he said, but you can't do that like out in the wilderness. You know, you can't cobble together new arrows. The farmer gardener uh, can search for food uh, for the characters, and um, in one day... Uh, he'll get enough enough food for one person for one day after three hours of searching around through the wilderness. The fishermen likewise can catch fish if they have the equipment and they're near a body of water that would have fish. Um, one hour fishing gets enough fish for one person for a day. The forester uh, um, can move skillfully through the woods, basically 50% chance um, to evade monsters when going through the forest, obviously, or a bonus to or anyone who's a ranger. And uh, druids who have the skill can find mistletoe more easily. The hunter, similar, spends um, an hour. They can find enough food for one person for a day for every hour they spend hunting. Husbandry, knowledge of animals so you can calm animals down um, and maybe encourage better behavior from animals. The jeweler, which has, a, you know, has the ability to, to approximate value um, gems or jewels that were found in you know in your adventuring um, they also and this is interesting gives them the ability to try and improve so they have a 10 percent chance to increase the value of a gem from one level to the next but uh, if they don't get that which 10 percent is not very good and if they fail 
uh, there's a 20% chance the gym's completely destroyed. So a little risk, a little reward there. The carpenter and mason, the carpenter can make wooden repairs to things, then the mason has a chance to, um, slightly better chance to find stone-based traps. The navigator has a chance to um, use the stars to help people know where to go. The sailor knows how to help someone um, sail a vessel. The miner, um, who's not a dwarf, uh, would have some some small chance to notice things like sloping passages, etc. Like the dwarf scales, but but lower than the dwarf. The shipwright knows how to build ships, so if he has enough time, he can build basic things like a canoe or a raft. The weaver uh, can do things like make um, uh, rope, or or you know if they're in town, they have access to the necessary stuff. They could maybe even make somebody some clothing. The tailor has the ability to alter clothing uh, to fit different people. The trapper can set traps and catch animals in an area, but that's going to take longer. It takes him a day to set his traps. He's got to come back and check his traps. But anyway, good thoughts and good job of, I think, balancing that out, giving you a little something you could do in the game without it being sort of too much because you still need to go to town and pay professionals to do a lot of these things, right? Scott Roy's got an article on making a game challenging. He talks about his basic biggest complaint is how players essentially met a game they think of things like what level am I, how many hit points do I have, um, how many segments does it take to cast a spell, and how you know, c and where they start using that kind of knowledge to calculate and make their decisions in game based on that. It's probably unavoidable. I mean, his solution, which is basically the dungeon master has your character sheet and you don't, so only the dungeon master knows your skills, only the dungeon master knows. Um, things like your movement rate or the casting rate of your spells. I think that's how the original game was played. You just sat over there, right? The players with your caller who would tell the DM what you do. And the DM had all the numbers and all the dice rolling. Um, and, he, and he says, well, you could let them roll over to hit, but you wouldn't tell them what they need. You just say, roll a d20, tell me what you got. And I'll just tell you, okay, that hits or that misses. I think he's right that th there's a certain, um, you know, that imagination part of the game and that newness and excitement of not knowing right what's going on so you really focus in on your character and what they do is there's probably a little something to that's a different experience and he thinks it's a better experience um i don't I, you know i just don't think it's realistic in this day and age everybody's got the books you know etc mercury um industry news tsr has announced you know Remember, Grenadier's license was canceled, that they're going to come out with their new, or already started to come out with their new um, miniatures at this point. Steven Jackson, Space Gamer, has been split into Space Gamer, Sci-Fi, and Fantasy Gamer. Fantasy, that's in his magazine. Dragon has announced that it is now going to be completely devoted to fantasy, that sci-fi type stuff will now appear in Ares. Remember, they got they bought, TSR bought out SPI. And now they're publishing Ares magazine for a short period of time. Howard Thompson, Metagaming, has some um, been closed and Howard just doesn't want to run the business anymore. He says it's for sale um, and he wants to focus on uh, on software games. The Game Merchant, a, a gaming advertisement and review magazine, I've never heard of that, um, has folded after 15 issues. Flying Buffalo has obtained the rights to the play-by-mail game Feudal Lords. Adventure Gaming Magazine is publishing again and Tim Cask has announced that they want to hopefully be a permanent fixture and you know, keep the magazine going for a long time. Unfortunately, they don't. I don't remember. I've got all, all of those. I don't remember if it's 11, 13 issues, something like that. And they announced that Steve Breeser has moved to Florida, um, even though they try to keep him involved. The last article is by Jeff Gallenkin. It's called Spell Reactions, and it's this guy's idea of what happens if you cast, you know, Flame Strike or Fireball or something at a wall of ice, uh, and how do they interact? Um, the question's a good one. The article's not great in my view because I don't think he, I didn't come away from it thinking, oh, this is something new that I need to think of. Um, you know, how many times do, do spells go off at the exact same segment so that they actually truly interact? The magic truly interacts with each other as opposed to like being more of a one two punch. But, you know, certainly, so his example of there's a wall, guy cast wall of ice. My reaction is it cost cast fireball or flame strike or something like that you know 
you would have to resolve the interaction between those two types of magic. Um, he doesn't give any particular ideas other than to say that's something you need to think about. Um, so I think that's that's true, and it's probably something I haven't thought through particularly, but I guess I've been playing for a long time, and it must not come up all that often, or I might have given more thought to how to think through that. Um, we had this um, advertisement, again, in the back from Nuts and Bolts of Gaming. So again, it feels like it's been six plus months now that they've been advertising, so they must have created this magazine, it seems to me. I just haven't found a copy of it yet. And then we've got some good art at the back here. I really like this art. I think this maybe is the best, um, my favorite piece of art with a purple worm in it I've ever seen. Uh, the drawing, you know, is very reminiscent of the early versions of the purple worm we saw like in the Monster Manual or whatever, and, or even in like in the Holmes box set, I think. But I just love the way he's like coming, he's like Dune, right? He's like coming out of the rocks. He's honed in on this guy and this dude's about to get eaten for dinner. I really like it. Uh, this is Michael Nye or Nee. All right, that concludes our look at Olympus number five, and that concludes our look at Olympus the fanzine. Um, I thought it was really good. I hope you guys have enjoyed this look at this fanzine. I hope you're enjoying the video series altogether, and I hope you're subscribed. If you have friends who might enjoy, please send them our way. Hopefully, they'll be subscribers as well. Have a great Friday. Have a great weekend. Till next time, my friends. Keep rolling twenties.